Well, good morning again, everyone. The theme of this summit is building the green economy. So it's correct to emphasize that the global clean technology industry sector is massive and getting bigger faster. Some estimates forecast that the clean technology sector will grow to $2 trillion by the year 2020. Other forecasts are even more dramatic. The International Energy Agency in Paris forecasts a clean technology market of over $13 trillion within the next two decades. So where will all these investments come to fuel this growth? Financing clean technology is one of the key factors in clean technology growth and diffusion. Yet financing is one of the most poorly understood constraints on the advancement of clean technologies. Without adequate, adequate and timely financing, new discoveries in clean technology will not enter the market and therefore will not benefit society. My friend and colleague, Terry Tamanen, and I partnered together on this session on capitalizing the green dream. I'm delighted to moderate this segment on defining challenges and opportunities in commercializing clean technology. The financing challenges facing clean technology are very complex. This stems in part from the fact that clean technology is actually a family of technologies comprised of, for example, wind power, solar, nuclear, biofuels, and energy efficiency, just to name a few. Across all aspects of clean technology, countries are making extraordinary investments. For instance, the Pew Charitable Trust stated that in 2009, China invested $34 billion in clean energy. The European Union invested $41 billion, and the United States invested $18 billion. It's time for us to catch up. Each technology has its unique pace and process of moving through the phases of commercialization. Indeed, each technology must face its own challenges of commercialization and its own funding gaps. The phases of commercialization and the corresponding funding, funding gap are shown in this framework on the screen. This framework shows various types of funding along the top, for example, basic research to angel investors, to venture capital, to private equity, acquisitions, or initial public offerings. Framework shows that technical and business milestones in the blue bubbles. Positive and negative cash flow of a company is represented in the center and highlights the large funding gap during much of an early company's development. And along the bottom, you see examples of the amounts of financial investments involved in the company. Now, some technologies require early stage financing by angel investors or venture capitalists. Examples include computer software that maximizes the energy efficiency of electrical machinery and appliances. Other technologies, however, are much more capital intensive, such as wind or solar power, and they require strategic corporate partner investments or private equity investments, or even funding from initial public offerings on stock markets in, for example, London, Shanghai, or New York. Now, regardless of the idiosyncrasies of the funding gap for different technologies, the commercialization process involves both challenges and opportunities, and today we're fortunate to have three really world-class experts on this panel to discuss challenges and opportunities. Let's now hear from these uh, panelists, and I will introduce them momentarily. pleasure now to uh, introduce these panelists. Uh, on your left, we have Craig Kogut, who's the managing partner of Pegasus Capital Advisors. Craig, welcome. <coughs> In the center, we have uh, Siapathy Chander, who is the uh, chair of the Energy Committee of the Asian Development Bank. And Ambassador Richard Jones, Deputy Executive Director of the International Energy Agency in Paris. Let's give them all a, a welcome. <laughs> well, gentlemen, we've got lots to talk about and many topics relating to fin financing uh, clean technology. So 
Uh, let me start our conversation by um, asking about um, the topic of regulatory uncertainty. So this is really the intersection of public policy and business and the financial markets. So uh, I'd be interested in your, your comments about um, the significant regulatory uncertainties that exist in the clean technology markets and how can financial institutions decipher and navigate this uncertainty and how does that affect the return on financial investment that they get? Craig, would you like to begin? Sure, thank you, Steve. Um, I'm a funny person to ask that question and I'm a private equity investor for those of you who don't know, focused on sustainability. We're zero, the reason it's funny is uh, our portfolio companies are zero for nine in getting DOE loans. Um, and yet, the important point I think is those companies are thriving. Um, and, and the reasons I think are what you've heard about in, throughout this conference, fundamentals. The world is net short food, water, energy, and long greenhouse gases. And as the governor spoke about a few minutes ago, and as you've heard throughout this panel, increasingly there's a focus on economic independence and on security. So even in the absence of government assistance, particularly if one focuses, and I'll give an example in a second, or maybe less sexy, less um, highly technological aspects of um, the investment world, I, I think there are tremendous opportunities today. So that's one of my messages of hope. So just bear with me for a second, and let's go on a quick due diligence trip. Let's go to a warehouse where there are shipping pallets, um, a basic instrument of commerce, as you know, together with containers. On one corner, there are shipping pallets made of wood that weigh 75 pounds, that have nails, mold, and can't be tracked or traced. And the other corner, and they're made from trees, as you know. On the other corner, you have uh, pallets made from recycled plastic that weighs 45 pounds, which have RFID tags and GPS. Um, which do you think Pegasus decided to invest in three years ago? Um, we invested in a company that began to pool and lease plastic shipping pallets. No government help at all, but the core message was that companies would save money. Um, and when they're saving money, they're saving carbon. So the statistics I just got from our folks a few minutes ago are that since we started three years ago, we now have 10 million pallets in our fleet. We've saved our clients 2 million gallons of fuel, which results in over 40 million pounds of greenhouse gas savings. And we've saved approximately 750,000 trees from being cut down. So I think there's a lot, we can talk about technology, but I think it's very important to remember that there are lots of opportunities. As if we follow what Bill McDonough said yesterday about viewing the world differently, there are tremendous opportunities. Oh, that's terrific, fascinating. <laughs> Chander, what are your observations on this topic? Hi, everybody. Uh, great to be here. Uh, thanks to the organizers for inviting us here. Basically, in any infrastructure project anywhere, there are four types of risks we can quantify. Technology risks, commercial risks, financing risks, and political risks. Essentially, these have to be managed. and. They are there everywhere, whether you do them and the, you do the projects in the United States or Afghanistan, they are there in some measure or the other. Political risks are more difficult, they are more uncertain than other risks, and therefore the method of mitigation is slightly different, and they are very specific to each country. Typically, what you want to do is to create some kind of experience in order to test out what regulatory ri risks there are in the system, and this is something like institutions like the Asian Development Bank and other governmental uh, institutions help test out. So we sit with the governments, we formulate policies we think are bankable. We test them out by putting our own capital in first to create projects that then have a track record and precedence so that commercial ones that follow can help. And uh, this has worked very well even in very uncertain uh, uh, environments. For example, we have partnered the Aga, you have heard, just had the slide on the Aga Khan Development Network. We have partnered with the Aga Khan Group in the Roshan Project, which is the largest telecommunication project in Afghanistan, very successfully. And the idea was to create a regulatory network, put in initial money, and uh, move forward to test the uh, market. We have done the same with many in many other countries on solar, on wind, commercializing as we go along. Thank you. 
Mr. Ambassador. Uh, thank you very much, Steve. Uh, I'll just uh, follow up briefly on uh, Chandra's comments. Um, in fact, I would add a fifth category, and that's perceived risk, because it's perception that really counts for investors. And uh, one of the things that we try and do in, in the International Energy Agency is uh, provide clarity, transparency, data. And one of the things that, uh, for example, inhibits investment in the developing world uh, is the perception that people can't pay for energy. Well, in fact, people in the, in the uh, developing world are actually paying higher proportions of their incomes for energy than in the developed world. And in some cases, they're even paying more on a, on a, uh, a, v a value basis for the energy services they receive that you and I do. And in fact, if, if uh, uh, a, a project went forward for renewable energy, it would actually lower their costs. And therefore, there are uh, 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 real chances that the uh, project would make money, that it would be repaid. But the problem is, is that in some cases, the financial Governor institutions. Schwarzenegger, ladies and gentlemen. Yes, sir. I have no idea what that is. <laughs> OK. <laughs> Another voice of God. Oh, oh, yeah. <laughs> Right. Carry on. You're okay. making great points. Okay. Uh, threw me a little off my game plan there. Um, but but in, in fact, uh, so we try and, and help uh, deal with these perceptions and uh, by providing data and transparency and information. But also we try and provide training and capacity building for people. Because what we find is, is that there is a real lack. Uh, there's a lack in the financial community, but there's also a lack in governments. Uh, around the world, but particularly in, in developing countries, that need to be overcome. So uh, gathering data, you know, simple bread and butter stuff that's not very sexy can make a huge difference in the long run. And that's one of the things that we concentrate on. Thank you. Very good. Fascinating. Can I uh, now uh, ask you to turn your attention to international patterns? All three of you have uh, extraordinary um, international experience. Um, and in fact, the ambassador just flew 21 hours yesterday to get here, so thank you for that, <laughs> from Adelaide. <laughs> now, many people traveled a long distance, but I think you might have uh, been the most immediate. I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> um, again, international patterns. So I'm curious about your observations uh, in different countries. So uh, financial markets work very differently in the U.S. versus the United Kingdom versus Asia. Uh, versus Latin America and so on. So, um, what, what are what are your observations in terms of the financing environments in different regions of the world? And Dick, we'll we'll start with you uh, on this one. Okay, uh, <clears throat> I, you're absolutely right. There are big differences in the markets between Europe, uh, China, and the United States. Uh, basically, in in Europe, uh, a lot of the money that's raised for these kinds of projects is on uh, project finance. And the reason is, is because it's very easy to demonstrate that uh, projects can make money because of the regulatory environment, especially because of feed-in tariffs. You know, it's pretty simple calculation that uh, you're going to be able to make money if you're guaranteed the price you can sell your electricity at, for example, for a renewable energy project. And so that has uh, tended to make individual projects bankable. On the other extreme in China, almost all the finance is uh, on the balance sheet of the company. And that's because the, they often get their loans from state-owned banks, uh, but they, they lend straight to the company. The United States is somewhere in between. It's a mixture. So the type of finance that you get uh, very much depends on the, on the regulatory environment. In, in Europe, because of the feed-in tariffs, they go for project. In China, because of the state banks, they go for balance sheet financing. The U.S. is a more mixed model. Thank you. Very interesting. Uh, Chander, your, your perspective in the Asian Development Bank is uh, extraordinarily international. And uh, what are your thoughts and observations? I think there's a need to make the emerging markets look alike like developed markets. So your diagram, which you have just drawn, actually should be valid across the board. The problem is that Terrific. the markets are imperfect. In most of the developing countries, they have gaps in the institutions that create those markets. And institutions like us, like the government, should actually go in to plug those gaps. When we do plug those gaps, they just work fine. For example, 
in developing countries to get long-term loans, 15-year tenure loans, 20-year tenure loans for infrastructure projects is extremely difficult. But these are necessary if you have to have tariff levels at affordable uh, rates for the public to consume those services. So unless we have the mechanisms to equalize the financing rates or requirements as are available in the developed countries, you can't have the same situation in the developing countries. And this is something we have all to work together to provide capital where it's required, the type of capital that's required at each stage of development of the project cycle. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. That's very helpful. And uh, you, you also raised the issue, a uh, very important point about the, the framework that I showed earlier. That's a very North American-centric uh, model of, of financing. But I wanted to put that up just to, if nothing else, just to create a straw man, if you will, to talk about funding gaps. And of course, these gaps differ in different uh, international contexts. So, Craig, your, your investments take you uh, uh, far and wide as well, also a great deal of international experience. So what, what, what differences do you see in the patterns internationally? Well, I, I'd actually agree that I, uh, we always look when we invest at risk adjustment and risk-adjusted returns, and they're often, because of this financing gap, there's not an actual correlation um, as to, it, it's often, too much of a gap in terms of the developing world than it should be because some of the financing mechanisms don't exist. I, I think one of the opportunities coming out of this conference, um, which my colleague Terry Tamina mentioned, is, is really working with people here to create the R20 financial arm, um, which can screen transactions, but also then help assist, I think, in evening out that curve. So there's the, clearly there will be greater risks in certain areas, but I think the problem now is the financing mechanisms don't correlate to those risks. I'm curious about uh, the role of the R20 activity in, in, in facilitating financing. Can you say a little bit more about the, the vision for that and how that might uh, um, facilitate the financing across international, different international regions? Well, I, I think the various people who obviously are going to be signing later today on behalf of, behalf of their states, provinces, municipalities, um, know what their regions need, um, know who are the good partners, um, can actually help provide very useful screening and due diligence, um, w which I think will create both a certification and clearinghouse mechanism, um, as, as well as, so, so I think we'll be identifying the best projects um, I think many of the projects that we've seen have a tremendous ability to work in one area and then be transported. And one of the things we've talked about as an example is if something works in one of the regions, one of the, on, on your chart, one of the issues, Steve, is obviously scale. Knowing you have more than one market to go to with receptivity, I think, increases the chances of getting financing as well as the chances of success, ultimately, then. And I think that's an important role for the R20 to play. Very good. Thank you for that. Um, I'd like to now uh, shift our conversation a bit and talk about um, uh, a theme that's, ha that's received a lot of attention in the, in the media and uh, really everywhere in the last two years since the economic downturn, and that is the uh, role of what many people call short-termism in the financial markets and the perceived pressure on corporations for quarterly earning reports that are consistent with the projections. And, and Craig, I'd, I'd love to have your thoughts on, on this. Uh, is, is, is this emphasis on quarterly uh, earnings reports really part of the problem? And if it is part of the problem, is there anything to be done about it? Um, first question's a lot easier than the second. Uh, I clearly believe it's part of the problem. Um, we've focused deliberately at building businesses that are worth more five years after we sell them. Um, than when we do sell them. I, I think the emphasis on short term, the emphasis, with, especially with the media that we have where you can get a trade in an instance, um, has led managers to make the wrong decisions, not planning for the future. Uh, how do you solve that problem? Um, I think partly it's getting investors themselves, the large institutional investors, to think long term, but that's not an easy task. We've, a number of us in this room have tried to get them Rather than talking about, for example, investing in sustainability and the subjects we're talking about, um, they make great proclamations, but they don't do it. 
precisely because they're not viewing things long term. They're not viewing what is a carbon liability 20 years out. So I think there's a lot of education that needs to be done. I don't think it's a regulatory solution. Uh, but I think investors need to, particularly the large institutional ones who can actually drive change as they've driven corporate governance, I, I think that's probably the best solution, but that's an imperfect one. Well, I love your point about corporate governance. That's a topic that I've studied for many years, and I think uh, boards of directors really have to take responsibility. That is the main cor uh, governance uh, mechanism, and it's the, the corporate board is closest to the corporation, knows the corporation, uh, the best, and uh, it's, it's more difficult, I think, to conceive of regulatory solutions to these problems. Chander, what are your uh, thoughts about uh, short-termism in financial markets, and do you, are you seeing a lot of uh, heterogeneity in this across the different markets that you follow? I completely agree with Craig. Actually, the problem is people have to have the correct frame of mind as investors when you get into a particular industry. For example, if you're entering into trade finance, you think short term because the turnover is maybe three months at best. But if you're planning to invest in infrastructure, one has to wait for about seven to eight years to break even, maybe the remaining 20 up to 25th year to get your returns. Now, this is very important, otherwise it creates friction and problems with the host government or the host community. And this is something very important and we look for such investors with a long-term vision when we decide to partner with them. And uh, I think that's essential. You cannot extract value out of a hydropower plant, for example, in five years. It's just impossible. Dick, your, uh, your thoughts, your observations of the uh, uh, short term in financial markets, but I'm really hoping you've got a solution up your sleeve as well, do you? Uh, if I did, I probably wouldn't be here today, probably out making money with it. Um, but yeah, it is a real problem, and it's a particular problem in terms of trying to persuade investment in energy efficiency. Now, energy efficiency, of course, is a whole suite of technologies, everything from, from more efficient lighting to better insulation in buildings, uh, more fuel-efficient cars, and so on. And one of the things that, that we find is that most energy efficiency projects only take maybe two or three years to pay back, and yet people still don't invest in it. And, and so there's this real, uh, there is this real problem that, that uh, they want even faster returns, and you just can't do that. And one of the uh, ways you can get around that, of course, is government can develop rolling funds so that, so that the government puts forward the money, uh, our, our development institution puts forward the money, inve in, invests in the energy efficiency, and then it gets repaid with, this, with the savings in energy uh, that, that flow from that investment. That's one way to, to go about it. But you, you do have to take a very active approach. And it's not always easy because sometimes, especially in energy efficiency, the people that are doing the investment are not the ones that are gonna get the return. And that's one of the real problems. This is called the principal agent problem. And that is one of the real problems uh, that you need to look at for investments in energy efficiency. But this is also a problem there. Chander, please. Thank you. I just wish to supplement. We have been investing around one and a half billion US dollars a year in clean energy. And we have seen counterpart funding to the extent of seven to eight dollars for every dollar we put in. So that's about nine billion dollars a year in difficult markets. We don't do easy markets. So I think there is a lot of pe people who wish to participate, but who also perceive, as uh, Dick correctly said, a lot more risk than there is. So I think it's a matter of getting together, focusing on getting a certain solution done, and then move on and commercialize it. Here, here. Well, it's really uh, fascinating. I feel like we've just scratched the surface and could go on and on and on for, for hours on these topics. But uh, what we've tried to do in this uh, panel is, is uh, uh, put our toe in the water, if you will, just on trying to understand what are some of the challenges and opportunities that are involved in financing uh, clean energy and environmental sustainability. So uh, would you please uh, join me in thanking our panelists for their thoughts this morning?